As Starbase rings in 2026, SpaceX is preparing for what promises to be a very busy year for Starship. Following five previous flight tests in 2025, the version 3 booster and ship for Flight 12 are being readied for pre-flight testing, all while several other vehicles continue production inside of the Star Factory. Meanwhile, here on the Space Coast, SpaceX has also brought in the barge that'll be used to transport some of those vehicles from Starbase for the first Starship launch out of Florida. Teams on the ground are also making rapid progress on the construction of both Florida and Texas Gigabay facilities that will eventually enable a much higher cadence of Starship operations beyond 2026. It's been a couple of weeks since we last caught up on everything, so as always, we have all of that coming up and more on this week's Starbase Update. We're actually starting our first episode of the year actually from right here on the Space Coast because it's stacked up to become a greater focus of attention in the next year or so. Not only is SpaceX working on activating Starship's launch facility at Launch Complex 39A, but they're also preparing to bring the first Starship vehicles from Starbase all the way to Florida. In the last few days of 2025, we saw a barge delivering a large LOX tank to the KSC Turn Basin. This is something that we have seen plenty of at this point. It's an active spaceport, remember, and SpaceX aren't the only ones building launch infrastructure, so deliveries like this have been pretty common over the last few years. But the company used for this delivery was the Bale Brothers, who SpaceX normally uses for these transports, so it seemed appropriate for this tank to likely be destined for LC-39A. The barge is Marmac 31 from McDonough Marine Services, the same company that made the barges that morphed into SpaceX's three Falcon support drone ships. What's interesting is that after this barge delivered the tank, it went to Bale's yard just a few miles to the south rather than leaving right away for another job. This was unique and led us to think that this barge could potentially be related to the long-awaited Starship transport vehicle, which Elon stated that it would be eventually be named, you'll thank me later, last year. Kiko Donchev, SpaceX Vice President of Launch, confirmed on X that this was indeed the case here. He said that there is still some work left to be done before it receives its name, but this tank delivery was a good trial run for transport. According to McDonough's website, Marmac 31 is 260 feet in length by 72 feet in width, or 79 by 22 meters. However, when the barge came in, it had sort of extra protections along the sides, so perhaps there might be some room left to expand in either direction here if they need it. As it is now, it seems like only one booster or ship might be able to fit at a time, so if they want to do more than one vehicle per trip in the future, they're going to need a bigger boat. Bonus points if you get that reference. But hey, it might be good enough for the time being, and once vehicle reuse is fully in play, they won't need that many vehicles transported. And also keep in mind though, that both the booster and ship will be returning back to the launch site. So even after launch, they'll be still on site locally anyway. What would be interesting is what sort of work that they can do on the barge between now and when it's actually put to use for transporting Starship. It wouldn't be surprising at all if SpaceX ends up adding a top cover or roof on deck. And well, if they did, it would sort of appear like NASA's Pegasus barge, which was used for transporting shuttle external tanks and is now being used for transporting SLS core stages to right here at the Kennedy Space Center. This barge may very well be out at sea for a long period of time, and you never quite know what the water, swells, and weather might be doing during transit, especially in the Gulf. So some protection wouldn't hurt. But when? When will these transports actually start? For that, we're going to have to have a look at Starship's production currently underway in Starbase. Right now, the only way to tell how SpaceX is doing with production is to peek through the windows on Star Factory and see what's going on with the ship's nose cones that we can see. The oldest of these ships inside is Ship 40. Its nose cone was mated to the payload bay a long time ago, and it has been receiving its forward flaps and heat shield tiles. However, in the last couple of weeks, we've observed teams drilling into a bunch of the tiles, and these drill sites have been marked. This likely indicates that these tiles are going to be removed or inspected at some point. Although, from the first signs of this happening in the most recent shots we've got here, it's been nine days and not a single tile has been seen missing. The tiles in this area are attached to the ship using pins. In order to remove them, they have to be literally drilled through hence why we think that they're about to be removed here. It's interesting that this is happening so late in the process, since these tiles have been installed on Ship 40 for quite some time now. This is also happening solely on the bottom few rows of the nose cone, rather than the entire unit. So it really begs the question as to what happened here. Did they find something from their own simulations and data analysis from last year's flights? 
Was it a last minute check on installation quality? We may never know, but this could delay rollout operations for Ship 40 into Mega Bay 2. Now, we haven't yet observed this work on the nose cones for Ship 41 and 42, which received their tiles in the last few weeks. Since our last update on Star Factory Affairs, we've also seen that SpaceX has assembled different platforms with a robotic arm that could aid in the pin installation where the heat shield tiles attach to. In fact, in the last couple of weeks, one of the non-tiled nose cones had been surrounded by this exact tooling, so it may receive its own pin soon. It's difficult to say when or which of these may be chosen for ship operations in Florida, but we may find out sooner rather than later because, well, the clock's ticking. In the last few weeks, we've seen more aerodynamic flaps for ship being delivered to Starbase, both aft and forward ends. This could mean that either they're stockpiling on hardware, or they may be about to ramp up stacking in ship production. Either way, it's a positive sign that the hardware is in place to support a large amount of ship assembly throughout 2026. Apart from the ships well down the production line, we of course also have Ship 39, which is slated to fly on Starship's next launch. This vehicle is still inside of Mega Bay 2, currently sitting on the center workstation as of the time of this recording. And it may very well stay there for a little longer than expected, because over the last week or so, SpaceX has set up scaffolding that covers basically the entire ship. It's unclear why this is happening, but keep in mind what we talked about just a few minutes ago. SpaceX is in the process of removing a bunch of tiles from Ship 40's nose cone inside of the Star Factory. So who's to say that they don't have to do this for Ship 39? If so, that would justify the need for massive scaffolding that reaches pretty much all the way to the end of the nose cone so that they can access the tiles there and replace them. If that's the case, then this could delay pre-flight testing more than we previously had thought. If SpaceX wants to launch Flight 12 during the first quarter of this year, they better accelerate through pre-flight testing and flight preparations to make it in time, potentially aiming for a February or March window as the debut of the version 3 vehicles for both booster and ship. In recent weeks, we've also seen composite overwrap pressure vessels, or COPVs, leaving the production site and heading towards Massey's for testing. These may very well be the ones we saw being swapped out of Ship 39 a few weeks ago, and this could have been prompted by Booster 18's test failure, as we speculated previously. But, as we have said plenty before, this is merely speculation and it's not certain that both are related, or if this was SpaceX's actual intention since Ship 36's explosion all the way back in June. Hopefully, all of this work on the ship will conclude soon so that it can move out to Massey's for cryo-testing. The sooner that happens, the sooner Flight 12 can get off the ground. So to this point, we've covered ship production, but super heavy boosters are the other piece of the puzzle here that they need to get to space. Tracking them, however, is much more difficult because their production area sits much deeper in the Star Factory, so it's nearly impossible to see where SpaceX is at in terms of progress. But we did have a major update from SpaceX about Booster 19, the booster currently slated to fly on Flight 12. In our last Starbase update of 2025, we mentioned that the last of its barrel sections had already been moved inside of Mega Bay 1, which meant that the top section of the vehicle could be complete soon. This must have happened rather quickly because just two days after that episode, SpaceX rolled the booster landing jig from the Star Factory and into Mega Bay 1. They need this so the top section of Booster 19 has a place to rest on while swapping bridge cranes inside, which is necessary for a booster to be fully stacked. Mega Bay 1 has two bridge cranes. One services the right-hand side of the building, and the other services the left-hand side. Since the top section of Booster 19 was being stacked in the front right corner of Mega Bay 1, and the bottom section was in the front left corner, they had to change bridge cranes during the operation. The jig left Mega Bay 1 that night, and on December 24th, SpaceX posted a photo on X confirming that Booster 19 has been fully stacked before Christmas. EJ was right. Keep in mind that it had only been 33 days between Booster 18's accident at Massey's, so having a fully stacked Super Heavy booster again inside Mega Bay 1 is an outstanding achievement. In the photo posted by SpaceX, we can see how that corner of the Mega Bay has been set up with fixed platforms in order to access critical areas in the booster's top half while it's there. There's even what appears to be some kind of clean room where the hatch to the methane tank should be located. Safe to say it's a much cleaner environment these days than the dusty tents of Starbase's infancy. This shot also shows that the methane tank had received one of its pressure lines before stacking, and that many of its COPVs had already been installed as well. Those can be seen in red here, likely from a protective cover for handling during construction. Not a bad thing considering recent events. The rapid pace of stacking here leads us to wonder, though, if this was just a one-off event, or if this is the pace SpaceX is going to have when stacking version 3 boosters going forward. It's possible that this could be a one-off occurrence for the time being if SpaceX pulled manpower and sources specifically for the task. For spaceflight in general, it takes time to scale that way, as Falcon 9 teams know very well. 
SpaceX was able to launch Falcon back to back in a short period of time many years ago, but it wasn't entirely repeatable right away. However, nowadays it's a much different story. It's not entirely uncommon to see back to back launches of Falcon on the same day, just hours apart anymore. It's happened a lot in 2025. But even if it were just a one off event and future boosters take more time to be complete, it shows that SpaceX is capable of doing things much faster and we just got a taste of it. Sooner than later, this will all become commonplace, especially once Gigabay is up and running. Now, the question is this, when will it be ready to go out for a cryo test and reset the clock? Going back to where they were when Booster 18 suffered its accident. In the case of 18, it took about two weeks from the booster being fully stacked to rolling out for cryo. Given there's been some downtime for the holidays, a similar timeline might seem likely for Booster 19's rollout sometime later this week. So, in other words, our next Starbase update may feature 19's rollout to Massey's for testing. Once cryo testing is complete, Booster 19 will have to go back into Mega Bay 1 to receive its Raptor 3 engines. And of course, those have their own testing campaigns to get through, which means it's time for our McGregor Minute. Since we last touched base about two weeks ago, there have been 32 Raptor engine firings at SpaceX's McGregor test site. Of these, only three took place from the Raptor North stand and no tests occurred from the Raptor South stand. This past week, our friend Gary Blair, who's a local to the area, flew over the facility and captured a few shots of the site. These images clearly show that SpaceX is still carrying out some upgrade work on both the Raptor North and South stands, with new tanks being staged in the area. We've seen more of these tanks arriving lately, which means that there is even more work left to do. This would explain the lack of testing from both stands. What's surprising is that Raptor South was where the second ever spotted Raptor 3 vacuum engine was stationed. We talked about this in our last episode, but here's a refresher. After having spotted RVAC serial number 8 multiple times, we finally spotted a second one, this being serial number 77. This was a great sign that SpaceX was likely ramping up RVAC production, having only seen one before. But of all three Raptor test stands at McGregor, for some reason, it only went to Raptor South, one of the very stands still receiving upgrades. Just a few days after being installed, SpaceX had it removed again and was driven away. Overall, this stand hasn't seen a test since December 10th, so it remains a mystery as to why they had decided to temporarily install the engine here. They must have had their own reasons, of course. Maybe the stand needed changes for the RVAC and they were doing a fit check, or maybe they spotted something on the engine, or all of the above. We might never know, but it's still curious. Of the 29 remaining tests that occurred at McGregor since our last report, several of these were relay tests that occurred following burns of just over two minutes in duration. It's difficult to not think of a booster flight profile when this happens. A smidge over two minutes is the amount of burn time a super heavy booster performs on ascent, followed then by relighting engines for boost back and landing burns. In the last couple of weeks, we've also seen SpaceX doing some cleanup of old hardware with well over a dozen Raptor 2 engines rolling out by our cameras, likely headed for scrapping. Nothing like taking advantage of the holiday season to do a little bit of cleanup. Thanks to Gary, we were also able to spot work going on elsewhere, and there are two great areas of interest. The first is where SpaceX set up that large scaffolding structure that was later covered by tarps. This structure remains a mystery, but it's been speculated for quite some time now that it may be related to testing Starship, HLS, or Human Landing System hardware. What's unique here is that the road leading here is gated. This checkpoint was absent on our previous flyover just five months ago, so it's a recent addition. This may mean whatever is going on here is highly restricted to only certain personnel. The second area of interest is where SpaceX used to test Falcon 9 landing legs. This area has been expanded over the last few years, and we think that this is where SpaceX conducted the methane oxygen impact tests that they have been using to better predict the impact of overpressures from Starship explosions. But in the most recent flight, we saw this ring that seemed suspiciously 9 meters in width, just like Starship with lots of plumbing and other hardware inside of it. There's also a tent next to it which was absent on a previous flight six months ago. One could speculate whether this is related to the overpressure experiments or whether this is something else. But by the looks of it, there's a good chance it's Starship related, but there's really no way to tell exactly what it's used for yet. We'll have a better understanding once more hardware is present. As with all things testing related, it's not just complete vehicles or engines that we keep track of. Starship test tanks are very important as they validate certain areas of the vehicle, potentially driving the timelines, not just for flight 12, but other flights down the line as well. Since our last update, the S39.1 test tank was rolled back from Massey's to Star Factory following around a week or so of testing about a month ago. S39.1 is the sole version 3 ship test article so far, aimed to validate the new ship aft design. So with its relocation back to Star Factory, that could mean mission accomplished here. 
but we aren't 100% sure though, so we'll have to wait and see. Another unit seeing additional progress at Massey's is B18.3, a test tank validating the new forward dome and hot staging truss structure of version 3 boosters. So far, it's only seeing cryogenic testing, but without being subjected to any loads. That may change soon as SpaceX rolled out a two-ring barrel section resembling the bottommost section of a ship. This unit, with a can crusher interface, was then lifted and placed on top of B18.3, similar to how SpaceX had tested the original hot staging ring design back in 2023. Back then, a compression cap was installed on top and was subjected to compression loads to structurally test the design. The ship skirt in this case simulates the aft end of the ship sitting on top of the booster. We should see something similar at some point soon, and hopefully that'll verify the new booster design ahead of Flight 12. And while the test tanks have been undergoing, well, testing, SpaceX is also building a new truss structure over the ship static fire stand over at Massey's. It's still unclear what its intended purpose is yet, but with every section installed, we are getting closer to finding out. Now let's go ahead and check in with the progress at Starbase's launch site, beginning with Pad 2, the next launch pad to see service here for Flight 12. In our last episode, we had mentioned that SpaceX teams had reinstalled one of the hydraulic actuators for Tower 2's chopsticks and that it was wider than the previous unit. Well, since then, the other chopstick arm has also received a brand new actuator, and both are now up and running. Teams have also continued installing the hold down arm hoods and other hardware on Pad 2's launch mount interior, which will protect them from Super Heavy's 33 Raptor engines during the initial phases of launch. On the tower, we observe SpaceX teams removing some of the tarps that were covering most of the connections between the new ship quick disconnect arm and the tower itself. With this area now uncovered, we could see that most of the larger plumbing from the arm had already been connected with the tower, but the smaller ones have not. And sure enough, just last night, being this past Monday into Tuesday, Pad 2 Ship QD Extension finally rolled down Highway 4 and into the launch site. In our last episode, we talked about the extension finally receiving its connection plate that will interface with ship. But since then, teams have installed all necessary flexible lines and hoses to support propellant load for ship. When daylight came, the forward end was then lifted and connected to the actual pre-existing component, completing the primary structure of the arm itself. This was one of the last remaining puzzle pieces, at least visually, so it's a great milestone to see checked off as SpaceX prepares for Starship's greatly anticipated version 3 era. As we've become used to by this point, we've also seen further testing of Pad 2's side of the tank farm in the last couple of weeks, and it puts on a show each time. Now, this is all merely a taste of what Pad 2 is going to be capable of, and I really cannot wait to see it all come together at full force with the full stack. Pad 2 is incredibly important for Starship's launch cadence this year, so well-tested pad systems bode well for the targeted cadence for 2026. And while all of this is happening, over at Pad 1, crews are continuing to dig around the area of the old launch mount to remove all of the foundations that were present for both it and the water deluge plate. It may take some time still, but slowly and surely, SpaceX is carving through the foundation and all will soon be in place to begin construction of the newer design of launch mount and flame trench at Pad 1. Tower 1 is also receiving some love as we see teams around each of its corners working their way through to refurbish the structural columns. Now, while it's unlikely that upgrade work here will be finished by the end of the year, it's entirely possible that the work here might be completed in time to support operations returning to Pad 1 in 2027, meaning two operational pads at Starbase for the first time. And to help supplement activity, SpaceX is building their own air separation unit here, or ASU, which will take air from the atmosphere and, well, separate nitrogen and oxygen out of it, elements that can then be used for Starship operations. Crews are continuing to work on the area where this plant will go, and it might not be too long from now until we see the actual distillation tower raised vertically and installed for the start of its work. SpaceX also brought a brand new electrical bunker to the launch site, which has been parked right next to Starhopper at the Danger Lot. It wouldn't be surprising if this was to either upgrade the existing launch site systems or if it was in place for the new air separation unit, but we'll find out once it's moved to its final destination. Now, there's a piece of the future launch equation here that we haven't really covered yet, a rather large one at that, actually two. That's of course the twin Gigabay assembly buildings going up in Starbase and here on Florida's Space Coast. Since our last update, teams have continued rapid progress on the building's framework. Both Florida and Texas Gigabays have new elevation levels in their construction, with Florida's now up to the fourth level and Starbase is now on its third. In the meantime, the lower levels are being outfitted with hardware and the buildings are finally starting to take shape, showcasing just how much Starship hardware will actually be able to fit inside for construction and refurbishment. If we're lucky, 
both facilities will reach their full height by the end of the year and perhaps even begin some operations to some extent. Maybe not fully with the vehicle assembly, but perhaps with storage or other needs that they might have. Hopefully the only fireworks that we see from Starbase in 2026 are that of the new year and successful flights from version 3 vehicles from Pad 2, with hopefully a bit more luck than version 2 had to start. Given how things are stacking up, how many launches do you think we'll see this year from Starbase? And I guess Florida as well. Will Starship finally reach orbit and deploy real Starlink satellites in 2026? Or completing a ship-to-ship -ship propellant transfer demonstration? We sure freaking hope so. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up this week's episode of Starbase Update. But as you guys all know by now, Starbase absolutely never sleeps. So we'll be back next week right here with some more info on how things are progressing, especially with Flight 12. I'm Max Evans for NSF. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll catch you guys next time.